No, it's, it's great to be here uh, at Winton. Uh, and of course, the London School of Economics and colleagues who organize this event. With respect to Winton, uh, for years I've been saying that every university worldwide should have a, a similar chair, let's say the kind of public communication of risk. I know it's slightly different, which is uh, David Spiegelhalter, I think, which is a major issue, I think, more and more. Anyhow, I'm here to talk about something that we recently worked on. The paper has just been submitted, so it's uh, basically, well, basically the first talk I talk, the time I talk about it. Uh, Model one, easy version. It's on contact-based risk sharing. Uh, and on, on, uh, I know that Pauline, uh, she excused herself because little Arthur has to perform this morning and she dutifully has to be there. But it's based on partly on Pauline's work. You will see later. Now, why am I, I'm, I'm, um, what's the background of this talk? It's, it's uh, let's say the big picture is quantitative risk management, regulatory, uh, developments and uh, relate to risk measures. And the main issue with the risk measures behind my talk is that we're now, exactly now, the last couple of years and the next couple of years to come, are faced with a regulatory environment in the banking and insurance world where various types of risk measures coexist. And the two types are the most important are value at risk and expected shortfall. They do coexist. They coexist within Basel II and III because just now, whereas Basel II was very much value at risk based, for the trading book, there's a move towards expected shortfall, tail of our conditional of ours. So we have a, a current situation where insurance uh, banks will presumably have various risk measures they have to minimize, optimize investments with, capital uh, allocation with, uh, regulatory capital calculations. Another example is, let's say, uh, in insurance, if you look at solvency, in the solvency world under solvency two, we have coexistence, uh, value at risk, uh, expected shortfall, especially if you, if you look also at the Swiss solvency test, which is expected shortfall oriented for insurance companies. So we are having a market where risk measures coexist. The question I would like to ask and discuss with you in this, in this talk is what are the implications for that? So this is not a talk where I say, well, let's look, there's an interesting risk measure. Let's see what I can prove mathematically on it. That's, because that's, that's not what I want. That's not my research really, but it's more this fact that these risk measures coexist. So, by the way, this is joint work with, um, uh, Haiyan Lee, Liu from Waterloo and Rudo Wang from Waterloo. I've been having various papers with Rudo, who's really a very, very fine scholar. So what I will talk about uh, is, first of all, the, some background to risk measures and risk sharing. And the, well, there are various specialists here in the audience. Uh, then I will uh, derive, uh, a spe for a special risk measure, which I will introduce, uh, some inequalities and, and see what the implications are for optimal allocations. Then I will look at properties of these allocations. In allocations, just not, it's not just a mathematical subdivision of, of uh, capital or risk, but they may have certain yes or no mathematical properties. And I will say also, going back to what I said before, are there implications? So at the end of the talk, can I say to Basel, given that they have to make the decision between value at risk and expected shortfall, which they do, whether we like it or not, yes, for those and those reasons, um, you should better take that one. And I will tell you later what that one is. Okay, so that's uh, the menu. So risk measures, uh, <coughs> very well known to this ocean. I will typically look at the regulatory situation. Uh, is calculating the amount of regulatory capital of a financial institution taking a risk, a random loss, X in a fixed period. So this is already important. I don't, I, nothing in my talk will be about dynamic risk measures. And for that matter, we take the, the good old uh, description, which you can find in many, many texts now, Fermer Sheet, Tachner Delman, etc. It's a functional from a space of random variables to minus infinity plus infinity. I take it closed. That's just to make the, the formulation more streamlined uh, across certain parameters later. X has to have a certain structure. You have to be able to take convex combinations of, 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 of positions, etc. So we typically take a convex cone. <coughs> Whether or not, I mean, 
bounded random variables or L1 random variables, it will be clear from the context. Of course, where these take, uh, where they are defined and which values they take is important. Atom loss probability space, typical uh, assumptions. Um, the typical uh, interpretation I have, the losses will be positive, the profits uh, negative. This makes a bit of a rethinking what, what concave, convex is, and it, it, it's a mess. I remember when Freddy Delbaum first came into my office around 95, 96 with coherent risk measures. It was the way I used to think of it, losses on the positive side. Then afterwards I changed. Since then, I just have no idea anymore what happens. Yeah. So then I never get my science right, so <laughs> it's a fact. And okay, so that's the situation. <clears throat> now the question I want to answer in this, so what is a good risk measure? Of course, this is a multifaceted question, but just some, some background that you may find in the literature. You, you get the, the regulators or the firm's perspectives can be different or even conflicting. You can have a risk measure or at least, I always say, sort of a financial dike height against the threat of a financial flooding, and you can leave out all the financial and then you're back to Holland and you look at dikes. All right, so that question is equally important in many, many, many areas of applications of stochastics. So what I, go, I stay with in finance and insurance. So you may have the taxpayer's view versus the shareholder's view. You can look at the whole issue of systemic risk in an economy via the risk of a single firm. And of course, allocation will be there relevant. Or within a firm, <coughs> of course, <coughs> risk management is used to reduce regulatory capital or a regulator may, may maintain high enough capital for the whole economy. So there are various questions, and of course all these questions inf in, imply some different, some different uh, uh, mathematical issues. The standard risk measure value at risk, and I know especially in this audience, many, many, many of us have warned against that risk measure for many, many years. It's there, it's standard. It's absolutely crucial, let's say, in, in reinsurance. I mean, reinsurance pricing is by definition value at risk pricing. You at hatch at a certain one in so many years, and like in north of Italy, earthquakes, one in 250, one in 500 years. That's the attachment of typical uh, uh, northern Italy uh, earthquake insurance, uh, excess of loss. So this is just a quantile. The only difference for this talk, and I, again, I made the confusion even bigger, I write alpha here, alpha is small. But of course, I still look at the right tail. It's, it's still like, it's still the same interpretation for positive losses, but the formulation of the results is a bit nicer if I just take the alpha small here. That's expected shortfall. It's a, it's a quantile. It's a, it's an inverse of the distribution function, properly defined. And then expected shortfall under its many disguises, tail var, conditional var, average var, whatever you call it, at level beta. Uh, is defined to be the average over all vars in the tail, but careful, the alpha is small, but I still go to the tail. Um, <clears throat> of course, then I have to have an L1 variable, and for continuity, expected shortfall of zero is the var at zero, expected shortfall of one is just the expectation. So these are all the classical definition, nothing special. The only thing I want to warn you a little bit about is... Uh, this ch change of uh, notation, slight not change of notation. So what is now the setup I want to look at? We have n agents, and the word agent in this talk is, I interpret very generally. I mean, all the examples I mentioned before, you can look at as agents. There's a total risk, there's a total asset, which you want to, you are, you are the agent in the market. There's a total asset, and you want, you all have your utilities or risk measures, and you want to optimally allocate that risk amongst you as, as players, as agents. Each of you may or not, I, I talk about risk measures, that's something else. Increasingly, the risk measure people like Dale Barnes start talking about utilities. You can do, I can't, but I mean, it, uh, uh, so I, I talk about underlying risk measures. Each of you has a, has a risk measure. This may be given by regulators, this may be given by internal strategy, whatever. So the target is this random variable X. And now what is a, a, a risk allocation in, in the definition for this paper, and this is a standard definition, is we want to subdivide, look at the subdivision of the total wealth X into N parts, each belonging to the various agents, such that the overall risk, if you sum the overall risk across all the agents, you want to minimize that. And of course the minimization here, you can try to interpret in any of the examples I said before. 
All right. So in some examples, the minimization is, a, is, an, is an obvious construction. In other examples, you would say, why would I do that in practice? All right. But uh, I mean, there, enough in the paper, which is on my web, there's a, a, enough examples to show that this is a relevant thing to do. So and we find that an optimal location in the term of, of our paper is, is called a solution to X if it exists. And of course, typically there will be more solutions. Now, now you can enter the world, which is not really my world, but you can enter the world of uh, optimal locations, Pareto optimality, etc. You go back to the, 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 the good old work of, of uh, Borg in insurance mathematics on Pareto optimality and, and comonotonic risks. That's all in the background. Anyhow, for monetary risk measures, uh, up to and all our risk measures will be, monot will be uh, monetary risk measures. That means you have the monotonic, monotonic axiom that the risk of, ca uh, of X plus cash is the risk of X plus the cash. That's monetarism. And then yeah, there have to be monotone. These are monotonic risk measures. Then optimal allocations and Pareto optimality are, are equivalent. So we, I will not, I will drop that word Pareto optimality from now. And we consider arbitrary allocations. There are no structure yet. What I want to see is if I can start solving the problem, can I prove the existence of some optimal allocation with perhaps certain properties of the allocated cash. One of them will be very important is co-monotonicity. I'll come back to that later, all right? Well, this is again what I said before in my introduction, some interpretations of these allocations. I mean, uh, it can be capital reduction within, within a single firm where the N agents are, let's say, N disks, or N is a holding with N subdivisions and subdivisions. It can be regulated to capital reduction for a group of firms. Now, the question you could ask, why would they work together? Well, whatever. I mean, I don't enter that economic discussion here. A standard interpretation is insurance and reinsurance. You're, a, 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 you're an insurer, and your agents are you, you're yourself, and you have, let's say, uh, N minus one reinsurers to subdivide the risk of a, of a catastrophe. That's a very typical. Uh, and overall risk distribution among agents, but I think. Okay, so here now, what's an allocation? And, and it, as I said, I mean, um, Pauline profusively uh, uh, excused herself to me for not being here, because now I would have looked at Pauline, so I look at Pauline, she's sitting there in the middle, but it's, uh, so this of course is now very much uh, close, uh, related to Pauline's work, very interesting work with, of Pauline with, uh, with uh, Nicole El Karoui early on. And it's the notion of inconvolution which is a mathematical tool of constructing, in their work, I seem to remember, I think it's for convex risk measure, how to construct some op such optimal calculations, some optimal, optimal, um, optimal uh, allocations to constructing explicit inf convolutions. And here it is. First of all, the set of allocations, it's clear. It's a subdivision of allowable positions. I mean, this is just my x power in, uh, which fill up the whole risk x. And the inf convolution of S of N risk measures, so it's, a, it's, it's an operation on risk measures, and it has this uh, funny notation, box row I, is mapping, as before, its risk measure. And the inf convolution, and you see it's getting close to the problem I want to solve, is the infimum of the sum of all risk positions measured by the individual risk of all potential allocations. So it's a pot if I write A N, it's a potential allocation. It's a subdivision of my risk. I calculate over a given subdivision, I calculate the risk measures, individual risk measures in four, in, involved. I add them, and then I get the, uh, the infimum. If it exists, if I can calculate it, that's the optimal allocation. So if this exists, then this xi star, which is typically, you know, of course, it's, it's, it's never really unique. You can always translate by constants with sum up to zero. Uh, but... Uh, if it exists, then, and, and I think important work of, of Pauline and, uh, and Nicole was at actually constructing such and looking at properties of such optimal allocation. So I, this is the notation I will work with. So I, I hope it's clear. So in the end, I would like to calculate inf convolutions, which is somehow a solution to my problem. Nothing special yet, because this is all well known. Uh, I haven't introduced anything new yet. Some classical references. I mentioned already Pauline El-Karawi 
D'Anjouini, Shachemari, and Tudzi also did a, a major contribution to calculating optimal allocations for convex risk measures. It was generalized by Filipovic and Vintland in some papers to non-monotone non uh, risk measure cases. Del Barn, of course, as always, has contributions to make, and I, I insist on, on getting Ruschendorf involved because I think uh, in the area of risk measures, uh, in many of these questions, I think, I don't think I can find any result that doesn't really go back somewhere, somehow, to early work of Ludger Ruschendorf in Freiburg. He will not appear explicitly in my talk, but believe me, he's always there. It's like Laplace when he said, whatever, whatever uh, Euler has written, read it. I think the same should be true with Ruschendorf. I, I, I know it's a bit of a, a, a jump, I think, and Luther would not forgive me for saying that, but uh, uh, I think it's, it's in a way true. So, well, what are now questions I would like to solve? Can you, kind, can you calculate explicit forms of optimal risk allocations under some conditions? Because now it's still very mathematical, there's nothing happening yet. Can you give properties such as comorontonicity, uh, Comorontonicity means that all the XIs are increasing functions of some underlying risk variables, let's say of your original X. And of course, comorontonicity, the fact that your, your risk allocation is, are increasing functions of your original risk, let's say, that's, that rules out a uh, moral hazard. Because if your risk increases, all your marginal risk contributions you allocate also increase. So that rules out moral hazard. So that's a very important, and of course that's why Borg's theorem is so important, because Borg showed the existence or the commonality of, of optimal allocations. So finding conditions on the, that the solution will be commonality is important. By the way, I think you all know uh, Nassim Taleb. I, I'm not sure whether Nassim Taleb once gave a talk here. You know black swans. Uh, the most recent book he's writing now is uh, Skin in the Game which, of course, is exactly comorontonicity. Uh, I think in the crisis, if more bankers would have real had skin in the game, it might have been a bit different here and there. It's, it's a... What I think the major new contribution in this talk is robustness. I'm not talking about robustness of risk measures. And, of course, robustness you can interpret in many, many different ways. I'm talking about robustness of risk allocations, which I think is novel in this paper. I think this is a new, this is something really new, and it's the most complicated part of the paper. And how is this linked to model uncertainty? So I would say this is the real contribution, uh, the new. <clears throat> now the question is how do the answer to the above questions may vary with respect to different underlying risk measures? Here I don't want to play a game. Once you have this paper, you can write 20 different papers. You just take another risk measure, and can you do the same? That's not a game I want to play. I want to be honest to the questions I asked in the beginning. I.e., <coughs> I started, because that's where a lot of my work goes, on the implications for regulation, especially VAR and expected shortfall. And Mark very well knows the, the whole discussion that we had for some years now, going back to some discussions we had at Imperial on this famous question of Basel II. What are the implications for the trading book moving from value at risk to expected shortfall, ex ex especially with robust backtesting. And this created a whole discussion. If you want to see the up-to-date reference on, on forecasting and these questions, I think you should look at one of Mark's la latest papers, I think. But that's a, it's an important discussion. It's a, it's a discussion not coming from us. It's a discussion coming from the regulators. Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. So... <clears throat> Value at risk, I said, I, I, I will take the alpha extended. This is just, a, I won't, won't spend time on that. Uh, of course, the alpha should normally be between zero and one, but I, I, it allows me to, 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 to uh, write the, the theorems in a bit more concise way, but all the interpretations are for alpha less than one. So I can have, uh, <coughs> for alpha greater than one, I put minus infinity, which is a, a quite nice big gain. Uh, the main point on this slide is this here. I'm looking, as I said, I will look at the risk measure. Well, this is the one. It's the range value at risk. It's like an average VAR. It was introduced by uh, Ramakont and colleagues because they wanted to look at robustness properties of risk measures. And it, in their terminology, it was under reconvergence. Okay, and so 
<clears throat> so they introduced this risk measure. For me, the only reason why I'm interested in this risk measure is because I want to discuss both expected shortfall and VAR. That's, I want to see how they interplay together. Well, they both are boundary cases of this. If, 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 <clears throat> if alpha is equal to zero, it's expected shortfall. If beta is equal to zero, you can value at risk. So somehow this two-parameter family of risk measures interpolates, quote-unquote, between these two risk measures I'm interested in. And our feeling was by studying this class of risk measures, we could start to solve these problems. And this turned out to be, I think, remarkably successful. Okay, and again, you have situations where uh, for practice totally unimportant boundary case. I should start using this pointer, I think. All right, so that's the, the range value at risk. It's an average far, but it's cut off uh, typically over this alpha region here. Uh, for alpha and beta, strictly positive and the sum less than one, which I would call the, 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 the standard risk measures here. It is a distortion risk measure, so you can write it as an integral over uh, quantiles distorted by some function, which are very important. It's monetary, co-monotonically additive, it's positive homogeneous, all the nice little properties. It is robust. Careful with the conditions here. It is robust. So this means that there is a genuine VAR part as a genuine expected shortfall part. It is robust. That means in, 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 the, con in the context of Ramakant, it's convergence with respect to, uh, it's continuous with respect to reconvergence. This is not true for the boundary cases. These are not continuous with respect to reconvergence. It's almost, you need a, co a condition on the continuity points of the, of the, of the limits there, uh, of, of, of your distribution in the, in the limits here, but I won't go into detail there. Conte, de Scandolo, they have a lot of work on that and have been generalized by Kretschmer, Sheet, and Saylor, and we have contributed a little bit on robustness of risk measures. I'm not interested in that. But that was the motivating example, the motivated discussion. And as I said, for me, much more important is this here. Well, first of all, these are nice risk measures on their own. But more important is our two risk measures I want to understand more about appear as boundary cases in this two-parameter family. And for the rest, it's just a nice set environment around these two classes of risk measures, which I think, uh, or you will see immediately a result, which I think is rather, rather cute, I think it's... Uh... Okay, so it's an average quantile. By the way, this is not a bad choice. Even discrete averages of VARs have been used. I think, again, Nassim Taleb once consulted, I think, was it for the BIS or so, I said, why don't you take a three-point average of VARs as a risk measure? So this is a continuous average. Uh, we take XVL1, I mean, in the paper we discussed various little refinements, we don't go too much in detail. And so the set of risk measures are called G. This has a rather interesting structure. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard the terminology um, uh, tropical, um, tropical geometry. Anybody heard about tropical geometry, Nick? I always, when I saw that word, thought it really would be nice if I could write a paper where I use tropical geometry. Well, of course, I'm dreaming of writing a paper on, on uh, somewhere in Hawaii or so, or Fiji <laughs> Islands. There is a link with tropical geometry here, <laughs> a very, very small link. <laughs> I don't think that will get me an invitation to Hawaii or so, but it's. Uh, but this is a nice structure. It's called. It's, it will see later. It's a monoid with uh, two additive structures on it the additive structure of sums and the additive structure of maxima, and then becomes a tropical geometry space. Wonderful. I don't think it's useful. But no, as soon in mathematics I find such a structure, then I'm certain we're onto something. There is, I think we know mathematics long enough, I think, to say there is no, no uh, uh, well, serendipity, serendipity, I think it's, uh, all right. This was something else. I always wanted to give a talk where I use the word serendipity. <laughs> okay, so and, and we call true VARs and true range value at risk, of course, if this, if this is really a true value at risk and, a and, and really uh, a true VAR, okay, so that I'm, I, I get rid of these marginal contributions. Okay, let's speed up. Okay, all right. Here it is. That's the wonderful inequality. It's if you take, um, if you take your risk positions, x1 to xn, arbitrarily numbers, positive numbers, 
then R var satisfies an interesting subadditivity property. And if I say subadditivity, then indeed these monoid properties on this group enter, on this, on this uh, G enters. Of course, you see, I now take one addition operator and a different addition operator. But here is the inequality. This measure satisfies this inequality. The range var over the sum of the alphas and the maximum of the betas of the sum of your positions, of course, this will later be my allocations, is bounded by the sum of the individuals. I think this is a really neat theorem. And this has remarkable consequences. And so that's, um, and the proof is not entirely trivial. Uh, it's not entirely trivial. It's, uh, it's not something, oh yeah, why did nobody see that? You have to work on it. Okay, um, so that I already mentioned here, the bottom line here. Uh, well, of course, if, if all the betas are zero, then it, that's another little inequality, but that's, of course, I'm, I'm sure that's well known. And it is exactly this point where it's nice to have the alpha small. Otherwise, I really have to start one minus these sums. This is the only reason for having the alphas the way they are. But the var of the sum of these small alphas is bounded by the sum of the individual vars. I'm sure it's trivial, it's well known, and it's all that, but it's, it's just a consequence. Of course, it's wider valid. For expected shortfall, if you take all the alpha zero, here all the beta zeros, we get this, the standard subadditivity property. There's a paper on my website you may in find interesting. It contains seven proofs of subadditivity. Now, why would you want to write seven proofs of subadditivity? Uh, as a mathematician, one proof, if it's correct, suffices, I think. The reason is I, when I was teaching quantitative risk management for many years, Every time I come to, to, to expect a shortfall properly defined and I want to prove subadditivity, I always face, uh, this is a broad class, I now have 190 students following my course, that's why I was late yesterday. Um, I always say there is no easy proof of that. Well, you don't need Hambanach or so or <laughs> difficult functional analysis, but there is no elementary proof of that. So I mentioned that several times to the students, then Rodo and I started discussing that, so we came up with seven proofs. One proof is, for instance, expected shortfall, you can see as a limit of L statistics, linear combination of order statistics. And then you use a separativity property of order statistics and you get it in the limit. That's not an easy proof. Or you can do some very tricky analytical calculations, or you can do it by optimizing optimization problem. It's an optimizer of a certain problem in, in operational research. The reason we wrote the paper, and I'm now drifting off, I realize that. The reason we wrote the paper is that every proof has an interesting mathematical twist to it, and more importantly, has pedagogical reasons. If you say we teach this course for operational research people, then I would say take proof seven or so, or this or that. If you're a statistician and you come from robustness, the book of Huber, where basically the whole theory of coherent risk measures can be found, then you take the L statistics limit case, etc. So that's why, okay, that's just as a comment, but I think I like that paper. Well, here's already the first theorem. Remember the inf convolution? The inf convolution was finding uh, an optimal allocation, the value of the optimal allocation based on a set of risk measures. These were the row i's. And the value of the optimal allocation is exactly this risk measure. If you take the R vars to start with, then the lowest, the lowest risk you can find over all allocations, which is by definition Pauline's and Nicole's inf convolution, is exactly this risk measure. And now you see, well, once we saw that, of course, we know we can sort of open the door in kind. The, 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 this proof, this part left to right, and this inequality is, <coughs> is tricky. I'll show you something. That's, <clears throat> if you look at it, the previous slide, that's immediate by the previous inequality. I will not go in by just into interpretation of the uh, of allocation and, and the infimum. You immediately, this you get immediately, immediately from, uh, uh, from that in inequality. It's just, it's just a one-line exercise. Nothing special happening there. But the other construction is difficult. Now here is my, uh, my dream of, uh, of the uh, uh, isotropic geometry. Okay. So what's now the solution? I said one direction, we explicitly construct an optimal allocation for this class of risk measures. And in the beginning, you might have said, well, here's another talk on doing calculation for a class of risk measures. I, I stress again, I use this class of risk measures because I want to make statements on regulation and risk sharing in markets or agents use 
either value at risk or expect a shortfall like the situation is today. So that's the main reason for this. But we get all these results out. Now, here's the optimal allocation. There's a condition here. Okay, the, <clears throat> the sum of the alpha i's, which are typically small, and the maximum of the beta i's, typically small, that particular sum has to be, if that is less than one, which is like a non it's, it's no serious condition. It's a condition. It's not a very serious one. And I just ordered the betas. That's not so important, but I, I will single out the particular beta later. Okay, then here is an optimal allocation. And the main, we have to see, A, I give you an optimal description of the allocation. Here it is. The UX, this will play a role. The UX is a standard probability integral transform from a distribution to a, uh, to a, uh, uh, the uniform. If FX, the distribution of my total risk, is continuous, okay, then I can just take uh, the distribution function. I don't have to, this UX, I can just take a standard uniform. I don't have to do any, any special construction. I'll come back to that later. If f of x is not continuous, there will be extra randomness in this UX. That means, what, if you think about it, for non-continuous distributed total risks, optimal allocations will imply, involve um, coin flipping. That thinking, meaning uh, uh, betting on markets, which we all have seen. Well, I have seen them definitely with some companies, uh, large bets being taken during crisis. But anyhow, here's the solution. And you see, I will not go into full detail. It's completely explicit. And you see, this is my uniform. It's completely... Uh, 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 Defined through the layers, the quantile, I, I basically uh, subdivide this upper quantile layer above this point, 1 minus P. And reinsurers know this. If you take your risk, is, is really expected shortfall. Expected shortfall is traditional in, for the continuous risks. It's like uh, um, excess of loss reinsurance. And of course, then I basically get the construction of excess loss of loss reinsurance optimal layers. And of course, this is exactly if you, if, if I were to draw this on a picture, you basically up subdivide this is one minus p, uh, and that's why the beta n here is the largest. So otherwise, I would have to write right the maximum. So it's it's just an optimal layer subdivision of this upper quantile range, which is not surprising, but it's nice that it holds in this generality. And I say for us, it's important we have this explicit form. Okay. Good. Uh, again, if f is continuous. <clears throat> this, this U of X is, is, is measurable with respect to X. That's important. If F is not continuous, it's like in the, uh, in the um, uh, Neyman Pearson lemma, then you have to flip a coin. Extra random comes in. And by the way, Neyman Pearson, we know, is very closely related to risk measures through the work of, of Hans Felmer, quantile hedging and all that. All right? so it's, it all comes together, but not, not really important here. Okay. So corollary, now I can start, okay, this is a theorem. I give you an optimal location. Now we can ask the question, which properties do we have, etc. So I take alpha as positive, is general, uh, x of, uh, an arbitrary risk, so no condition. Then for pure value, it's not pure because there can be, well, for value at risk, this is the optimal value, risk value. And of course, you come back to the theorem and construct, construct the, uh, the optimal location. Or, of course, in this case, remember I said there's a condition here. We can only construct the optimal allocation if this condition holds here. Okay, if, if these are zero, we have to have the sum of these alpha, small alphas to be less than one. Okay, so that's, that's this construction here. Okay, an optimal allocation is given. Okay. In the case of expected shortfall, it's all trivial because that's a separative measure. You put all your risk in, in the largest beta, but that's, uh, that's, that's nothing new there. Properties. So now, now, what can we derive here? Underlying risk measures, <clears throat> I will uh, look at the R vars. I stay there, okay? And I'll, I'll take the, the proper case when the sum of the two is less than one, okay? I also assume that this condition is satisfied. So there is an optimal allocation. I can calculate it. And I assume that we call it doubly continuous, a bit of a wrong, a wrong word, I think, but both the distribution function and its inverse are generalized inverse have to be continuous. Okay, that's. 
I already said before, if my distribution is continuous, this ux, this, this constructed uniform random variable, okay, it's just the f inverse of your, your original risk, standard first lemma in probability theory and statistics, it's an, it's an element of the sigma algebra chain is measurable with respect to x. If not, we have a problem. We, now we want to go say something about the properties. I've, I've proved the existence of the allocation. I, I calculated for you the inf convolution, so the lowest value that I can attain. And so let's now look at, we now say, what are now sharing principles? This is sort of uh, the fix, okay? For the various suppositions, and I, an allocation is now a sum of these fix is, is equal to x. And the example is exactly what I wrote before, okay? And I now want to think about what are the properties of these fi's, okay? In, in general, this is an example. I said it's non, it's non unique. So you're just introducing a bit of notation. I already said before, gambling behavior enters. So if you're, you're, the, 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 the risk of your total loss is, is non continuous distribution, then uh, our optimal allocation will involve gambling. And we give examples in the paper. Okay, so here's the first result. What we're from the beginning, not we're aiming at, because believe me, I couldn't, we couldn't guess these results. Perhaps some of you may, but I, I, we couldn't guess them. Here, here are some results. For a continuously distributed risk X, there exists a co-monotonic, and by the way, I, I keep my conditions here. Okay, I, I don't repeat them now, but this condition is, is still, oh, where is it? Yeah, I keep these conditions here. Okay, so I have an optimal allocation. Okay, and now I want to look at the properties of the optimal allocation. Well, here is one result of the paper. There exists a co-monotonic optimal allocation. So that's an optimal allocation that avoids moral hazard. We all have skin in the game. If the risk increases, all our personal risk contributions also increase. It's not that yours is offsetting mine, which I think occasionally it will do in real life. But <laughs> uh, so there exists one if and only if, and now I come to a, a nice little result, such that for all j different from i, alpha j is zero, so they're all, at most, one can be a value at risk in the market. All the others have to be expected shortfall. So I re rephrase this result, and this will be the largest one. I rephrase it to have a co-monotonic optimal allocation for this class of risk measures. At most, one true range value at risk, or more importantly, true VAR, uh, can occur. The one with the largest beta is allowed. That's if it's the, the R var. So that you cannot have more. If you have more vars in the market playing wrong, then, then you don't have common authenticity. Then there will be moral hazard in the market. And you can, you can choose the optimal allocation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I will skip that. Um, let me say, let me go to another, another uh, uh, set of questions to make sure that I stay in the time. Um, there are many interpretations of this, but I think it's clear. It tells us already that you cannot have more than one VAR in the market. I say your company and your company plays with value at risk. That, then there is moral hazard in this if you want to optimally allocate. Uh, and you can construct them, but that's of course. Now, it, robustness. And I said I'm not talking about robustness of risk measures. I'm talking about robustness of risk allocations. So what do I mean by that? Well, it's a topological question. If I change my, my, my uh, risk a little bit, would then the optimal allocation also change a little bit? And now, of course, changing a little bit, you can take your favorite topology. In the paper, we discuss weak, weak topology, the, the L infinity and L1. I will just mention L1 here. But you, that's, I think, the, and now I come to the, the deeper result of the paper, the proof of the, the next theorem is, is, I think, is not at all, not at all trivial. Okay, so for given risk measures, row one to row n, I'll just give you the definition. An allocation, remember this, this notation I introduced? An allocation of the risk in subparts in a and x, that just means the sum equals to x, and they're all allowable random variables. Is L1 robust? It, exactly what I said before, if this function is continuous with respect to the L1 norm. This is exactly, if, if you change a little bit the allocation, 
that you would also not expect the, the, the total risk reduction to change much. It's, it's a natural definition of robustness in the L1 norm. Okay, so robustness means that small, if you reinterpret this, as I said before, if you have small uh, model misspecification that does not ruin, whatever ruin means here, the optimality of a sharing principle. You, 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 you don't change much your, the fact that you're at the optimum or close to the optimum. And this can be replaced by other metrics. So that's the definition. Well, theorem, so I, said, I, I always want to go back to my original question. What does this have to bear on a market where VARs and expected shortfalls are now used together? And robustness, of course, is extremely important. Remember the question uh, of the VAR, of, of the, 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 the Basel Committee, it was uh, robust backtesting. I know this is not what I say here, but of course, model uncertainty, robustness is very high up uh, on the, um, on the, the, uh, in the minds of the people that, that regulate and not write down regulation. So here for a doubly continuous X or F of X and the inver generalized inverse are continuous. So a very smooth distribution function. There exists an L1 robust, as I defined before, optimal allocation if and only if all the betas are strictly positive. That means you can have no Nobody is allowed to use in that market optimal alloca allocation using value at risk, a pure value at risk. And again, of course, you can say, well, of course, yes, this value at risk being blind in the tail and all that intuitively perhaps is true. But well, many results are intuitively true. But here's a mathematical theorem, all right? So this is even only if. And I must say, I mean, the proof is non is non trivial. And you, it's not deep mathematics, but it's, it's careful crafting of, of inequality. It's, 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 it needs several pages. So that, I think that's the second result. So we have one on optimality. We have one on, on, uh, on common authenticity. We also understand when or when not we can have uh, extra gambling in the market. And we have a result that tells you even only if for this class of, of risk measures, the RFR measures, uh, that you need to have a, uh, you can't have a true value at risk in that, in that market. I think it's a nice little result. Oh, not, not little. Okay. Well, I mean, I said we, we have others. Other, we can do it for the levy metric. We can do it for L infinity. Um, there are various, the results we prove are true for many more, uh, many more uh, topologies. But uh, we stick to L1 because we want to have expected shortfall there. So this is, I think, we now have three. If you ask people, what are the, the common questions you would like to answer on allocation? Well, certainly your allocation should have to say something on moral hazard commodity. That's a famous Borg theorem, and that it has to be. You cannot have a talk on allocation if you don't think under what conditions do I have common authenticity. We have that. Extra gambling, we have that. That's not deep in here, but it's, it's in the construction of the optimal allocation. And then some notion of robustness. I'm not saying this is the notion, but it just says if you change a little bit your allocation, then the minimal, the optimal value doesn't change too much in L1 norm. I think it will be difficult to uh, come up with a different definition. You may change your metric, but that's all. And we have all the results for those two. So what are now the applications? I'm now winding down the applications uh, for regulatory capital. So some implications. So there are some issues with value at risk as a regulatory risk measure, assuming arbitrary risk sharing is allowed in the market. And of course, companies do this kind of risk sharing. Within a bank, you see this in value value at risk based risk sharing at the level of uh, of uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, the way risk capital is distributed between various uh, various trading desk well what are sort of uh, a firm clearly has insisted incentives to split its risk and this is called regulatory arbitrage I mean, general general frame of regulatory arbitrage uh, sharing one firms is, if, is not necessarily co-monotonic. If we have that, and of course, I've got result for risk sharing to be co-monotonic. We run into the whole issue of, of moral hazard. Sharing among firms may be reliant on an extra source of randomness. This is his gambling behavior. So we have included that too. Sharing is not robust. Well, uh, insolvency under model uncertainty. I mean, that kind of questions is also touched in the paper. Uh, and the total regulatory capital after sharing is much smaller than your value at risk. That would, of course, mean that you have insufficient capital for the whole economy. That gets it a little bit into the area of systemic risk. But I won't, don't, don't want to push that too far. I think there's enough results in the paper 
uh, which I think give at least a, a new view of several of these questions. So some partial solutions. Um, we should definitely regulate against particular forms of risk sharing. I think at least regulators should be aware of that, although I'm not stressing, well, not st I'm stressing that, but not too hopeful that will make big difference, I think. Okay. <clears throat> risk sharing does not reduce the total risk in the economy, economy but reduces the total regulatory capital. And your X says the same, but the capital you need to underline this X, of course, you can really, by some crafty constructions, reduce. You introduce costs for splitting a business, business of a firm. This is one way you should do. And of course, that's done now. There's a lot of, let's say, uh, these uh, balkanization and living will constructions and all that. Uh, but I said, going from this paper to those huge issues, I mean, there's no solution. Welcome, Pauline. You missed the income evolution, but I'm sure Arthur did very well. <laughs> I told the audience that not only Arthur was, was a bit um, nervous, but I'm sure the mother was very nervous. <laughs> but he did well? Very good. So it's on inf convolutions. <laughs> okay. And of course, what we make very clear in our paper, because you saw that, it's if, and that's a big if, if they want to regulate with one particular risk measure between VAR and expected shortfall, I cannot help it. Our paper is fully in favor of expected shortfall for various reasons. Okay, various reasons beyond all the reasons that people have mentioned before. So, um, the conclusions, so what have we achieved in this paper? We have found optimal risk share, we solved the optimal risk sharing problem of VAR R VAR. So we calculated for this range value at risk the inf convolution and uh, we, we, we explicitly solved it. It was based on a very nice thing of tropical, you never will forget it, tropical, I almost said tropical island, tropical geometry inequality, which really opened the door for analyzing the results. So we calculated these inf convolutions and we proved, and this is, I think, the main contribution, a robustness of the allocation, not robustness of the risk measures. Under very specific conditions, the market cannot have VARs in it between the various agents. Uh, and I would summarize that value at risk should be taken with extra caution as a regulatory risk measure. This we know for a long time. Um, you know, I, I stopped discussing that with the regulators, presumably, because, believe me, there are many, many, many more serious problems than that. But I think at least uh, they should be aware, perhaps, of the little things that we have done here. Um, these are the references, and you see, uh, Pauline, you're number one on the list. So it's, it's a paper that really got us going, the inf convolution paper. Um, and there are various results being published. I said the paper... Um, is on the on the uh, on the website uh, I mean, for you to download, and uh, I thank you for your kind attendance. Thank you. So, does the tail of the distribution of X show up in any explicit way in this? Yes, of course they do. If you look at the splitting, yeah, of course they do. They, um, you, you, what you ask is how explicit do they? Uh, I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> of course, here, here, I so said the construction of this optimal allocation. Of course, you, you really, it, 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 it shows up in details explicitly. The optimal allocation. But if you think of I mean, if you oh, in robustness property. Not, you know, it yeah. Uh, okay. So um, not in the way we. I mean. Okay. Let's go back to the theorem on robustness. It's a. It's a good question. Uh, so <clears throat> here we only are saying if you have a, a nice smooth distribution function, whatever the tail is. Uh, we have this L1 robust optimal allocation, even only if the, the market doesn't use any VAR. In that statement, I mean, of course, it uses the constructions of these, these optimal allocations. Hang on, what's the L1 robust mean? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Like, you know, it's a bit, yeah, okay. I, it's a good question. I, 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 I said it's implicitly in the construction. It, it, I'm sure it's in, in the proof somewhere, but 
one should perhaps, I mean, it, it might be you want to look more, to a slightly more refined version of robustness here, but it's a good point. I mean, I, it's, because it is only says that you cannot use the files. And in, in the sense, this is saying you should, your allocation should take care more of the tail. You see, because it, it, in this class, it, you should have expected shortfalls, basically. So you should really allocate taking more the tail into account and not disregarding the tail. Okay, that's what the result said. What else? Okay. You gave the definition of uh, robustness in the same, usual sense that if you change allocation of it, the risk measure changes it. Yes. But you also mentioned before that if you change the risk measure on it, the allocation changes again. Right? Now, okay, and the inverse of a continuous function is continuous, but would it, in this case, would the two definitions be equivalent? So uh, what you're saying, uh, transporting a robustness property of the risk measure to the robustness property of the allocation. Exactly. That's what you mentioned. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned that explicitly, and I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. The one implies the other. Of course, in, in the background, it's there because somehow these robustness properties of these risk measures either value at risk. But of course, we talk about the L1, the L1 metric here. I always have to be careful on the what metric because if it's three convergence, then we know, at least I know the various properties. Uh, presumably, there is a line there. I mean, I, it's not in my head now, but there must be a line there. Any more questions? Right, so let's thank the speaker.